Being an ace means that you downed five enemy aircraft. Being a double ace means that you downed ten enemy aircraft. But being the ace of aces means that you downed the most enemy aircraft. Today we're talking about Richard Ira Bong. He is America's ace of aces, credited with downing 40 enemy planes in the Pacific Theater of World War II from the cockpit of his legendary P-38 Lightning, Marge, affectionately nicknamed after his wife. And just to be clear, when I say he's credited with downing 40 enemy planes, those are confirmed either by film or by eyewitness. He downed 40 planes. That does not include his probables. That does not include all the planes that he critically damaged first and then let his men finish off so that it could boost their morale. And it does not include the giant crocodile but we're gonna we're gonna get to that right after an awkwardly relevant word from our sponsors this video is brought to you by war thunder they've got over 2500 tanks planes and ships pretty much all of them between world war ii and modern time and my favorite part about it is not only how accurate the vehicles are but all the historical easter eggs that they also have in the game for an awkwardly relevant example let's say that i wanted to play as a p-38 but i don't want to just play as any p-38 i want to play as richard bong's p-38 it's actually possible to get an exact replica of his legendary plane marge it has the red nose cones and wingtips that were unique to him because paint was so hard to come by in the Pacific theater. It has the portrait of his wife and the cursive lettering Marge next to it, as well as all the flags symbolizing his downed enemies. Even the serial number on the side is accurate. And it's not just the paint job that's accurate. It's everything else. You can go in and see what type of engines his plane had. You can see what kind of guns and cannons are in the nose cone. You can see what type of bombs it's capable of dropping. You can see the self-healing fuel tanks, the cockpit, everything. And then after you're done checking everything out, you can actually go fly it and shoot down enemies yourself. So if you wanted to give War Thunder a try, it is free to play on PC, PlayStation, and Xbox. And when you use my link down below, it's going to get you a bunch of freebies to get you started off on the right foot. And then of course, we do have to give a special thank you to Delete Me. It's the best business model on the planet. You give them money. They make sure that data brokers on the internet aren't selling your personal information. If you like privacy, you're going to love Delete Me. As always, that's going to be linked down below and over at thefatelectrician.com. Let's get back to the video. All right, September 24th, 1920, Richard Bong is born. He grows up on his family farm in Poplar, Wisconsin, an extremely small rural town. His father, Carl, is a first-generation Swedish immigrant, and Richard is the oldest of nine siblings. Okay, look, I'm not going to beat this into the ground, but I need us all on the same page. Richard Bong is a farm kid from the Midwest that grew up during the Great Depression as the oldest of nine siblings, okay? He was probably tougher than me and you combined by the time that he was eight years old. I'm just going to leave it at that. Speaking of when he was eight years old, that is actually when fate would step into this story. You see, young Richard, or Dick, as everybody called him at this point, was pretty much your average farm kid from the 1920s. He got up before the sun did, did chores until it was time to go to school, went to school, did the best he could, came home, worked until the sun went down, had dinner, went to bed. But then in the summer of 1928, something amazing happened, or at least something amazing to an eight-year-old that's never seen a plane that's grown up in a cornfield, a plane flew by one morning. But it wasn't just any plane, it was a US Army plane, and it flew by so low that Richard could actually see the pilot in the cockpit and he waved at him, and the pilot actually waved back. Then later that day, when Richard was doing his evening chores out in the field, the plane flew by again, this time going the other way. And the next morning, the same thing happened. And the day after that, and the day after that, and the day after that. It went on for weeks. Richard has no idea at the time, but that plane is actually carrying the mail of President Calvin Coolidge, who had decided to take his summer vacation in the next town over, Superior, Wisconsin. And it just so happens that the Bong family farm is directly in the flight path. This seemingly random act of fate is what sparks Dick Bong's initial interest in aviation. And at the age of eight years old, he becomes completely obsessed. Every spare second he has with his extremely busy, manual labor-filled childhood, he spends research and studying aviation. He reads every book from every public library that he can convince his parents to take him to. For every birthday and Christmas, he is asking for scale model replicas of different planes. But then one day his dad, a World War I veteran, tells him a story that he remembers from his time in the service. The incredible story of America's ace of aces, Eddie Rickenbacker, the race car driver that turned into a fighter pilot and is credited with downing 26 enemy aircraft, more than any other American during World War I. And with that, it becomes Dick Bong's life ambition to become a fighter pilot. 
Okay, but here's the problem with that. At this point in time, America's not at war. And generally speaking, whenever a country, particularly America, is not at war, the standards of certain jobs or the entry into the military at all gets raised pretty significantly because they only want the best of the best because there's a limited amount of jobs. When there is a war, they need a bunch of more people. The standards get lowered. We bring a bunch of people in, okay? Now, there's no war, so the standards are very high. If you want to be a fighter pilot, you need to be a military officer and you have to have gone to college for two years. Why is that such a problem? He's like 10 when he decides this. So like 1930, the Great Depression started in 1929, okay? During the Great Depression, over 20,000 American schools just closed down and kids couldn't even go to school if they wanted to. And most of the kids didn't want to because they had to stay home and work or go do odd jobs to try to make money so that their family didn't starve to death. So for a farm kid growing up in rural Wisconsin, this is going to be an extremely uphill battle. And despite that, he does it anyways. He goes to school, he works his ass off, and he is almost the top of his class every single year. And then he gets to his junior year of high school and he finishes it. Problem his town just doesn't have a senior year for high school, so he can't graduate. So he does the only thing he can do. He figures it out. He enrolls in Superior, Wisconsin High School, 30 miles away, and just figures out how to make it to school every single day and ends up graduating 14th in his class of over 400. Okay, next problem, gotta go to college. Finally, this kid catches a break because there's also a college in Superior, Wisconsin, the University of Wisconsin Superior. So he applies, he gets in, starts going to college. He's not really going for anything in particular he has zero ambitions of getting or finishing any degrees he just needs to get two years worth of credits to be a fighter pilot because that's all he cares about and then fate seemingly steps in again in 1938 so his first year of college the united states government passes the civil aeronautics act which is Essentially, on paper, what they said it was for was to train the next generation of pilots because commercial flight and a bunch of other things was going to become available on the civilian side. What it was actually for was the U.S. government knew that World War II was looming and they wanted to get as many people trained in flying planes as possible so that hopefully a bunch of them would either volunteer to go into the military or they could then draft them into the military because they knew they were going to need a ton of pilots if war broke out. So the United States government is going to foot the bill for college students to learn how to become pilots and as it would just so happen one of the first colleges in the country to get this program was the University of Wisconsin Superior and Dick Bong was one of the first people to apply and get accepted. So now he's getting college credit to fly planes. It's like a dream come true. He absolutely loves it. He is a complete natural at flying. He is the top of his class when he finishes the course. He then gets enough college credits to get accepted into the military academy in June of 1941. And right as he is about to graduate from the academy, the attack on Pearl Harbor happens. This changes the entire trajectory of Dick's career. You gotta realize he's almost done with his training and now there's going to be this massive wave of new recruits that both volunteered and got drafted coming in behind him. So he's like in this bottleneck, essentially getting shoved through the training as fast as possible. And when he gets out of the training, he's going to be one of the most experienced pilots the military has. And pretty much all of their pilots are going to end up being trainers, including Dick Bong. He ends up getting stuck being a gunnery instructor on the T-6 Texan. And honestly, it probably sucks, right? Because he ends up having to instruct all the new guys and then the new guys get to go off to war and have his dream job. He's been working his ass off since he was eight years old to meet these incredibly high standards. And then the second he meets those standards, gets his foot in the door, a mob of people comes running past him and he's basically stuck there holding the door open for everybody else. And the T-6 Texan at this point in time that he's training all these guys on is just a trainer plane. Like they're not sending T-6 Texans out onto the battlefield. So he's literally stuck teaching guys how to fly the trainer plane, which means that Dick Ball hasn't really been assigned to what type of pilot he's going to be, and he really doesn't have a say if that day ever even comes. So he's actually training all these guys in gunnery, so how to be a fighter pilot, even though he's not even assigned as a fighter pilot. If his day comes where they do send him to war, they can still make him a bomber pilot. So he's essentially training people to take his dream job from him. All right, kiss, kiss my ass. Kiss his ass. Kiss your ass. 
Happy Hanukkah. But then one day, as fate would have it, yet again, on May 1st, 1942, a fighter pilot shows up to his airstrip in a brand new P-38, and he wants some extra training. And Dick's happy to oblige, but the problem is, is he's flying a T-6 Texan, and this guy's in a P-38. The T-6 Texan is so old and outdated that it's only getting used as a training vehicle, and the P-38 is the hot new thing, okay? It's better than the T-6 in pretty much every conceivable way. Dick Bong is probably about to get smoked. Despite that, Dick Bong dons his plot armor and goes in and actually whoops this P-38 pilot's ass 15 times over. If this was a real dogfight, he would have shot him down multiple times. They land, the P-38 pilot gets out, goes, debriefs with Dick's chain of command and informs them, that's the best natural pilot I've ever come across ever. He's like, that dude's in a T-6 Texan and I couldn't get him off of me. Why is he here? At which point the chain of command's like, huh, maybe we should... Maybe we should do something with him. So they assign him to a fighter wing and send him off to go train on the P-38 Lightning. All right, we need to take a minute and fully appreciate how badass the P-38 Lightning is because it's probably one of the most slept on planes of World War II. And for that reason, it's probably my favorite. Now, the reason the P-38 gets overlooked so often is because generally speaking, whenever we're talking about fighter planes in World War II, we're talking about either the European theater or the Pacific theater. And when we're talking about the Pacific, it's usually carrier based planes that we're talking about because that was all the biggest battles of the Pacific theater, the Battle of Midway, the Battle of the Philippine Sea. They were all carrier based aircraft and the P-38 is not that. We we also didn't see it very much in the European theater because it didn't perform very well in the colder temperatures seen at the higher altitudes above Europe. But it was absolutely wrecking house above North Africa and the Pacific theater. It was just taking off from islands instead of aircraft carriers. The Germans that ran into it over North Africa started referring to it as the fork-tailed devil, and the Japanese called it two planes, one pilot. Yes, I realize there was a shitty joke there about a cup and a couple of girls, but we're not going to make that joke. We're just going to keep moving. <laughs> Enemy pilots absolutely hated going up against the P-38 Lightning because it wasn't really a fight. It was more or less them getting sucker punched and then if they were lucky enough to survive, they got to lose a drag race after that. And this is because the P-38 Lightning isn't a fighter plane, right? The first letter in a plane's name is its designation. For example, F stands for fighter, B stands for bomber. So the F-4F Wildcat is a fighter. It starts with the letter F. The B-17 is a bomber. It starts with the letter B. P actually stands for pursuit, like the P-51 Mustang but it's technically not a pursuit plane either because it didn't meet the criteria. It's just the one that fit the closest. They actually had to come up with a new designation just for this plane because it was so overpowered, they didn't have a category that it fit into. You see, the P-38 was actually designed prior to World War II, so nobody had any idea what aerial combat was gonna look like, so they were just like, Fuck it, let's make a plane that's awesome at everything. The committee in charge of developing the P-38 literally just looked around at all of the other types of planes, the fighters, the pursuits, the bombers. It was like, yeah, we want all of the upsides and none of the downsides make it happen. The spec sheet that they put out to military contractors on what they wanted this plane to be capable of didn't really read like a spec sheet. It read more like an impossible wish list. Nobody even knew if this was possible. They wanted this plane to be able to fly a minimum of 360 miles an hour in level flight, which at this point in time was fucking booking it. But I mean, you could build a fast plane. That's not really an issue. Then they also wanted it to have a ton of firepower. They wanted it to have four 50 caliber machine guns and a 20 millimeter cannon, which, okay, a little bit harder, but you can still build a fast plane that's got a couple of guns on it. They also wanted it to be able to climb up to 20,000 feet in less than six minutes. Okay, now we're, we're really pushing what a plane can do. Oh, and by the way, we also want it to be able to carry a thousand pounds of bombs while it does it, which is really the tipping point because now not only is that borderline impossible, it's also not even allowed because technically a fighter and a pursuit airplane are only allowed to have 500 pounds of bombs. They want to double it and make it faster than any other fighter on the market and have more guns than pretty much any other fighter. So when they put out the bid for this plane to be built, they're not allowed to call it a fighter or a pursuit aircraft because it exceeds the limitations for those categories. So they're like, fuck it. We're just going to come up with our own category. We're going to call it the interceptor. Good. Yeah, the committee in charge of developing the P-38 is on some gangster shit. They're like, well, we can't call it a pursuit aircraft because that implies that they might actually get away and they're not gonna. And we can't call it a fighter because that implies that they stand a chance once we get there and they don't. So we're actually going to request an interceptor, which is some shit that we just made up. Okay, the moral of that story is that this should actually be called the I-38 Lightning, not the P-38 Lightning. The problem with this is this is all just one big ask and none of the defense contractors think that this is even possible to actually make. 
except for one, Lockheed, because they have this new badass aeronautical engineer by the name of Kelly Johnson. If you don't know who Kelly Johnson is, he is the man that would later go on to be the founder of Skunk Works, America's premier top secret plane development program that is responsible for a ton of innovation like the SR-71 Blackbird and the F-22 Raptor. So Kelly Johnson and his crew are the ones that are gonna take on the challenge of developing the P-38 Lightning. And it becomes very apparent to them pretty much right out of the gate. It's not possible to do this with a single plane engine like most fighters have, so they're like, we're gonna have to have two plane engines. So like, fuck it, let's just take two fighters and slap them together. I mean, it works in checkers, why wouldn't it work in aerial combat, right? Jimmy, grab that fighter plane, bring it over here and king me. And just so we're all on the same page, a single one of these engines is more than enough to keep this plane in the air. With two of them, this plane is gonna be capable of traveling 413 miles an hour in level flight. To put that into perspective, that's roughly 100 miles an hour faster than any other fighter plane on the planet at this point in time in 1940. He's so fast. He makes fast people look not fast. Not only is it gonna be significantly faster, it's also gonna have significantly more firepower. Most fighters have like 450 caliber machine guns. The P-38 is gonna have 450 caliber machine guns and a 20 millimeter cannon mounted in the nose, and it can carry bombs or rockets. And then on top of that, not only do these massive engines allow it to go faster while carrying more firepower, it also is allowed to operate at a higher altitude, meaning that now they are always gonna have the high ground when they enter into a dogfight. So when the P-38s show up, they get to attack you from a above at speeds that you can't match and then if you're lucky enough to survive they get to just road runner themselves out of the equation because they're a hundred miles an hour faster than you and you can't catch them beep, beep. But that's assuming that they want to run away because the P-38 Lightnings are also more maneuverable than a ton of modern fighters as well because the massive dovetail allows them to catch more wind, giving them a tighter turn radius so they can probably beat you in a dogfight anyways. They are an absolute nightmare to deal with and Dick Bong is about to go train and become Freddy Krueger. So by June of 1942, Bong is nearing the end of his training on the P-38. He's exceptional at flying it. He's the top of his class and then he goes and does something kind of stupid. So he's out on one of his last training flights that he's ever gonna have in the P-38, and he decides, you know, it'd be pretty cool since I'm about to graduate and I probably won't get in very much trouble because they're gonna send me off to war anyways, I should take my P-38 and weave it in and out of the Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco, and then I should fly it right down Market Street, 30 feet above the street, literally in between the buildings of San Francisco. So that's what he does, and his plane is flying so low to the ground that the wind coming off of it is actually ripping clothes off of clotheslines throughout San Francisco, and then he makes his way back to the base, and he is in a whole world of trouble, more than he ever thought he would be. And this is the part where most people are like, oh, he's probably gonna get in trouble because that seems pretty dangerous. And like, yeah, that's a small part of it, but you have to appreciate the bigger context of what's going on at this point in time, right? It's June, 1942. The attack on Pearl Harbor happened six months ago, okay? And this kid decided it'd be funny to take his very strange, lesser known military looking plane and fly it through a national monument and then down the middle of a major metro area. In San Francisco of all places, which is probably one of the most likely targets of the Japanese empire if they were going to attack America again, similar to how they did at Pearl Harbor. This scared the holy shit out of a lot of people. I mean, right so this is literally no different than if a commercial pilot decided to fly his commercial airliner really close to a skyscraper in New York City in January of 2002. Okay, like a lot of people are really freaked out by this and they have a great reason to be. Now in Dick Bong's defense, obviously he wasn't thinking about that at the time. He's like a 21 year old dumb kid that's just excited inside of a fucking warplane. Like a lot of people would have done the same exact thing. He feels horrible and he gets called in to General Kenny's office, the guy running the entire training program and he is He's shitting his pants. He knows that he is about to get probably kicked out of the military, grounded, potentially even thrown in jail. And General Kenny has been following Bong's career closely ever since he showed up at school to learn how to fly the P-38. And he is super disappointed that his top student would decide to do something this stupid. He brings him into the office. Dick Bong is nervous. This kid's shitting bricks. He can barely look the general in the eye. And the general's basically like, dude, what the fuck, man? And Dick does the best thing he absolutely could have done. He just completely owns up to it and is honest and upfront with General Kenny. He's like, look, I'm sorry. I'll take whatever punishment I need. That wasn't my intention. I was just a young, dumb kid, excited, horsing around. 
It wasn't the right thing to do. I'm sorry. And at this point, General Kenny realizes on one hand, you can't do this shit. But on the other hand, this is exactly the type of guy you're going to need if you want to win this war. He then tells Dick, and I quote, Son, the fact is, if you didn't want to do loops through that bridge or fly down Market Street at second floor level, I wouldn't want you. Now I'm paraphrasing for this part, but he more or less says, so here's what's going to happen. I had a woman call the base this morning, furious that one of my planes took out all of her laundry off of her clothesline and blew them all over Market Street. So you're going to go, you're going to find that woman, you're going to do her laundry, and then while it's drying, you're going to do any chore around the house that she asks you to. You're then going to fold her laundry, and then you're going to come back, and this shit never happened, and he tears up all the reports and throws them in the trash. So Bong, realizing he's basically getting a second chance, happily runs off and does that. And like an hour later, General Kenny gets a phone call to inform him that he's no longer going to be running the training for P-38s outside of San Francisco. He's being moved into the Pacific Theater and he is going to be running the entire air war in the Pacific. And he requests that he has one pilot come with him that he wants to remain under his command. And that pilot's name is Dick Bong. I need your help. I can't tell you what it is. And we're going to hurt some people. Whose car are we gonna take? So fast forward like a month, Bong is over in the Pacific Theater. He's setting up shop. He's getting his plane squared away. He's getting ready to fight this war. And then there's this advisor for the US government that comes in, some fighter pilot from World War I that's going around from air base to air base consulting and basically just seeing what's going on and you know making suggestions. This fighter pilot's name was Eddie Rickenbacker, Bong's childhood hero, America's original ace of aces. So Rickenbacker's over there. He's talking to Bong and some other young pilots pilots and General Kenny's telling them stories and they get on the topic of how he actually broke the record and got 26 downed enemy aircrafts. And Eddie Rickenbacker tells him, well, for one, we were flying over land. So whenever I shot somebody down, there was never any doubt, right? So like I could see the wreckage on the ground later that day. I could go back and check and we could verify things. Whereas you guys are fighting over the ocean. If you shoot a plane down, it sinks. We have no idea if you actually shot it down or not. And the other thing is there's so many Germans in the sky of World War I, I just had more opportunities than you guys are probably going to have. At this point, Dick Bong chimes in and is like, actually, sir, I hear we have plenty of Japanese to shoot at up in the sky around here. Eddie Rickenbacker kind of just smiles, clearly understanding that this was a challenge from this young pilot. And he says, I'll tell you what, if you can shoot down more Japanese than I shot down Germans, I'll buy you a case of scotch. At which point, General Kenny immediately says, and I'll double it. And then the next man up the chain of command, General Hap Arnold hears about this and says, and I'll buy a case of champagne. And then the next guy up the chain of command, General MacArthur says, I'll double the champagne as well. Double it! Then, unfortunately, this gets picked up by the media and they make a big deal out of it. You know, they've got the picture and the headline and it's like, America's ace of aces, Eddie Rickenbacker and America's top generals make bets for alcohol with young pilots to down enemies. And there's like a bunch of public backlash because you got to remember, Prohibition was 10 years prior. Alcohol is still very controversial and a bunch of people feel like, you know, you shouldn't be bribing these young men with alcohol. They should just go out there and fight and never have fun and come back home. Because of that, the chain of command kind of backpedals. They put out a statement being like, okay, fine, whatever. We changed the bet to Coca-Cola instead. And then they ended up giving Dick Bong and a bunch of other young pilots a ton of Coca-Cola and it ends up being his favorite drink. I must have drank me about 15 Dr. Peppers. Now, Bong isn't ready to be the man yet, right? He's never actually been in combat. So he needs to be tutored. He needs to go out there with an actual experienced pilot that's going to help guide him through the chaos of battle. And he gets assigned to be the wingman to one of America's top aces at this point in time, a guy by the name of Thomas Lynch. In December of 1942, Bong is out on a mission mission in a squadron of 12 P-38s led by Sam Lynch and they end up running in to 40 Japanese planes and they actually engage. They actually end up shooting down 12 Japanese planes, two of which were knocked out by Bong himself, earning him his first two downed enemy aircraft and a silver star. From here on out, it's just consistent. One enemy here, two enemies there. By the next month, January 1943, Dick Bong becomes an ace pilot after downing five enemy aircraft. And right around this point in time, Bong actually ends up leaving the mentorship of Thomas Lynch because Thomas Lynch actually ends up getting sent back over stateside because he needs to go on leave because he is being such a successful combat pilot that he has the most downed enemies out of anybody in the entire United States military at this point in time with 15. So Thomas Lynch is 
essentially getting sent home to protect him because he's America's top ace. The last thing they want to do is have him get shot down in combat. And right now in the media, everybody knows his name and like the other nine of the top 10 aces. And everybody's trying to speculate who and if and when somebody is actually going to break Eddie Rickenbacker's record and become the new ace of aces. So a lot of the top guys at this point in time are all getting sent back stateside to do like war bonds drives, recruiting, improve morale, raise money, things like that. And this is going to actually end up giving Dick Bong a chance to catch up. So with Lynch stepping aside for the time being, Bong is now running the squadron and on one of his very first missions, things just get weird. One of his wingmen has one of his engines go down and he doesn't think that he's going to be able to limp it all the way back to the base. And he really doesn't want to try to land it at the base because P-38s at this point in time are very hard to come by. If you lose your plane, you might not get another one. So the last thing he wants to do is try to land it on the airstrip and accidentally end up taking out even more planes because that's going to hurt the war effort even more. So they make the decision. The best thing they can possibly do is for Jaeger, this young pilot, to bail out and then they'll just have to recover him him. he'll live the plane's gone it's just it's going to be what it's going to be that sucks so they're trying to limp this plane back and find a good spot for jaeger to bail out bong calls back to base and gets a smaller recon plane known as a piper cub up in the air and they're going to help keep track of jaeger once he does bail out so that they don't lose track of him so that they can recover him quickly now the ground rescue crew is also on the way the piper cub finally shows up gets eyes on jaeger at this point bong is about to run out of fuel so he's like okay piper cub you're going to keep eyes on him bong goes goes back to base, lands, fuels back up, turns back around and goes straight back to the lake to pull security in case any of the Japanese happen to find them because the Japanese are well known for opening fire on any downed pilot or rescue crew that they can find. So Bong gets back to the lake. Remember, he's at a super high altitude because he wants to be able to see the enemy from as far away as possible. He's not really concerned about what's going on with the men on the ground. So from his perspective, he sees that it looks like Jaeger's made it to the shore of the lake. He seems to be all right-ish. Maybe he broke his leg. Who knows? We have no idea. The rescue crew, for whatever reason, decided that the fastest way they were going to be able to get to Jaeger was to be able to take a rubber raft across the lake rather than skirting around the edge and fighting the jungle the entire time. So that seems fine. And then there's this big ass log that's kind of like floating near that raft, right? So everything seems to be going just fine. So Bong radios over to the Piper Cub pilot and he's like, hey, I'm up above you. If you see anything, if you need anything, let me know. I'm right here. The Piper Cub pilot radios back frantic. He's like, dude. There's a fucking giant crocodile swimming up to the raft right now. That's not a log. That's a crocodile. Bong immediately dives and goes and he strays this crocodile. And here's the thing with this that I forgot to mention during the P-38 chapter where I talked about the plane. As you already know, it's got four 50 caliber machine guns, each of which is well capable of killing a crocodile. And then it has a 20 millimeter cannon, which is super duper capable of killing a crocodile. The thing is... It's only got one trigger and it fires all of them. So yeah, the crocodile's dead. It basically gets aerosolized instantly. The crew rescues Jaeger. Everybody makes it back to the base. Hooray. Then everybody starts giving Bong shit like, hey, you know, we always paint a flag on the side of our plane when we down an enemy. Are you going to paint a crocodile on the side of yours? Should we double back and see if we can get the crocodile's body and make some handbags out of it? What are you guys thinking? Then the media gets a hold of it and they run the story. They got funny headlines like lightning strikes gator, gator versus lightning, all kinds of crazy stuff. But regardless, it kind of fuels into Dick Bong's legend and he is now on everybody's radar as the ace pilot slash crocodile killer. So the media starts giving Dick Bong a lot more attention, but he doesn't pay much attention to it. He just keeps doing his job. He's growing into his shoes as the leader. He's going out, he's leading missions, and then he gets another kill and another, and then two more here, two more there. Next thing you know it, Bong is a double ace with 10 confirmed down enemy aircraft. So now not only is Bong the crocodile hunter, but he is also rapidly catching up to his mentor, Thomas Lynch, for having the most confirmed kills in the entire United States military. And he is now in the running to become the new ace of aces. And right around this time, one of Bong's wingmen requested an audience with General Kenny because he had to tell him something about his star pilot, Dick Bong. This young pilot shows up in the office and tells General Kenny, Sir, he's given away Japanese. And General Kenny is like, what, what are you talking about? What do you mean? And he proceeds to tell this story about how they were out on a mission and Bong shoots up this zero to the point that like it's going down. The wing is literally tearing off the side of the cabin, at which point Bong peels off and instructs his wingman to finish shooting that zero down, even though it was already going down. And this young pilot figures like, OK, well, maybe he's just like training me. Maybe he wants me to get target practice. I have no idea while he's doing this. Then they land, they get back from the mission and Bong comes up to him and he's like, hey, I saw you down that 
zero, I'm willing to sign off on it so that you get that confirmed kill. At which point this young pilot is like, no, you you had that. It was, it was already done. It was over with by the time I shot at it. That's your confirmed downed enemy. At which point Bong is like, look, you shot it last. It's yours. If you don't take it, I'm not gonna. So it's just gonna go untaken. At this point, General Kenny just smiles, tells this young pilot, look, whatever happened, that's between you and Bong. You guys can figure it out. You're dismissed. He leaves the room. General Kenny realizes that Dick Bong is being an exceptional leader. He's not trying to be a glory hog. He's not caring about this race to be the ace of aces. He's just going out there trying to make sure sure that he gets the job done effectively and keeps everybody as safe as possible. Now, that being said, General Kenny was also kind of interested to find out just how much of a badass his starfighter pilot was at this point in time, so he kind of started to keep track the best he could and try to figure out what Bong's criteria was as to when he took the kill and when he gave it away. And what he was able to figure out was he figured that for every two kills that Bong took, he gave one away. So Bong could have easily ran up the scoreboard and padded his stats to be an even more impressive pilot than he already was, but he cared about his men more. And this would become even more apparent about a month later. He's racked up five more confirmed downed enemy aircrafts, tying him with his mentor, Thomas Lynch, for 15. If he shoots down one more enemy plane, he becomes America's current ace of aces in World War II and the most likely man to break Eddie Rickenbacker's record. And he's out on a mission and he does just that. He downs one more enemy aircraft and then he looks over and he sees that one of his wingmen has an engine down and he's desperately trying to limp his plane into the clouds as a zero is closing in on him. Bong now has a decision to make. On one hand, he's the new ace of aces. He knows it. When he lands this plane, if he makes it home safe from this mission, he might never fly again. He probably doesn't have to if he doesn't want to. They'll ship him back home to America to sell war bonds where he can party and live up the high life for the rest of forever. He's a celebrity now. On the other hand, his guy needs help. He immediately dives and positions his P-38 in between his friend and the Zero in such a fashion that the Zero either has to veer off course or drive directly into Bong's plane, killing both of them. The Zero veers off, but now Bong needs to get his guy more time to be able to make it into the clouds so that the Zero doesn't get back on his tail. And the only way he can think to do that is to become a more enticing target so that the Zero tries to down him instead. So Bong shuts off one of his engines and then starts jerking the controls left and right and up and down, making the plane look unstable and like he's desperately trying to level it out so he doesn't crash. The Zero interprets this as Bong's about to go down, so he veers off towards Bong because he wants the for sure kill. So Bong basically baits this Zero away from his wingman, and then once he gets far enough away that his wingman's in the clouds and he should make it home safe, Bong starts the second engine and attempts to outrun him, at which point the Zero opens fire and shoots the cab, but Bong is just out of there because his plane is so much faster. See you, chump. Couple minutes later, the Zero ends up giving up, it peels off, Bong's making his way back to the airstrip, and then suddenly the P-38 starts shaking violently, and Bong is like, what the fuck is going on? He's looking around, he turns around and looks, and the ass end of his plane is, well, half of it's just not there. Apparently that Zero had hit him with way more machine gun fire than he had thought, and he needs to be able to get this plane down now. Bailing out isn't really an option because there's Japanese all over the place and they're going to kill him or strafe him with machine gun fire the second he gets into his parachute. So he's got to try to land it somewhere. He knows that there's a nearby island that the Marines had just captured that they were working on building an airstrip on, but it wasn't finished yet. Okay, not a great option, but it's literally the best option he has. His options right now are land in the jungle or land on a partially built runway. So he opts for the runway. He radios ahead to the base like, hey, get the construction crews off that runway. I'm coming in high. I'm about to wreck my plane. So he goes in, he lands, does everything he can to get this plane stopped in time, but it's just not possible. Ends up overshooting the runway and driving into the ditch in front of it. While he wasn't able to stop all the way on the runway, he was able to slow down enough that the ditch stopped him and he was able to walk away without a scratch on him. Upon inspecting his plane, he had been hit over 50 times from the Japanese Zero with multiple rounds being stopped by the cockpit armor and saving his life. Dick Bong had almost died, yet somehow not even gotten hurt. It's a classic case of plot armor, and he is now also the top ace in World War II, and he doesn't even have a plane. That P-38's complete garbage now, and for most pilots, if you lost your plane, you probably weren't gonna get another one for a long time, meaning that you were gonna be grounded. However, this is Dick Bong, the top ace of World War II. They got him a new plane in like two weeks. So that's great, but the real problem that comes into play is now General Kenny's chain of command, you know, the top bosses are like, okay, well, your boy Bong is the top 
ace of World War II right now. We need to get him home. We need to keep him safe. We don't want him getting hurt. He's a celebrity. He's the crocodile killer. But General Kenny knows Bong better than any of these guys, and he knows that Bong isn't interested in being the ace of aces. He's not going out there taking every kill he can. He's not trying to get stats. He's going out there and doing his job to the best of his ability and trying to save as many of his men as he possibly can. And for that reason, General Kenny wants him to be the number one guy. But he also realizes that maybe that's not fair to Bong either. And maybe Bong does want to go back home and that should be his reward if that's what he wants. So he kind of very tactfully puts the ball in Bong's court and gives him the choice of what he wants to do without actually doing that. And the way he goes about doing that is he tells Bong, hey, when you get 20 confirmed kills, I'm sending you home for two months for vacation. And he knows that this means that Bong is going to pick and choose when he hits that 20 kill mark because he knows that Bong isn't a glory hound. He'll shoot down 20 enemy planes and give all the kills to his men if he wants to. And that's his choice to make now. So naturally, Bong does what any Midwestern farm kid would do. And he perfectly times him hitting 20 confirmed down enemies so that he makes it home to Wisconsin just in time for deer season. I don't just knock them out. I pick the round. So Bong gets back to America. They parade him around. He's in the newspapers. He's on the radio. They're interviewing him. He's going, he's doing war bond drives. And after a couple weeks, he's like tired to the chain of command. He's like, look, I just want to go back home to Wisconsin, see my family and hunt some deer and be left alone for a little bit. Can I do that? And they're like, okay, yeah, fine. You deserved it. Go ahead. They get him a train, takes him up to Superior, Wisconsin. And he gets to Superior the night of homecoming for the University of Wisconsin Superior, his former college. And he goes to the homecoming event, ends up bumping into the homecoming queen, and they end up becoming a thing. Which, I mean, A, obviously that happens. I mean, look at the guy. He's clearly the main character. Obviously, he's going to get to date the homecoming queen. However, B, this is kind of a crazy scenario to think about that probably happened all the time in World War II, right? I mean, could you imagine being like a high school senior or a college freshman or sophomore that was a dude going to school at this point in time trying to score a girlfriend? Like you go up to the homecoming queen trying to hit on her thinking you're hot shit because you played varsity football. Then you find out that she's already being hit on by the deadliest fighter pilot in United States military history. You're just completely outclassed. Like you never stood a chance. You haven't even got a name tag. You've got no chance. Why don't you just fall down? Go on, son. So Bong ends up scoring a date with the homecoming queen. He takes her out to dinner at this diner. And while they're out at dinner, little kids are coming up to their table asking Dick Bong for his autograph in front of the girl that he's trying to impress. So obviously she gets swept off her feet. They fall in love. They end up dating the entire rest of the time that he's in America on leave. And during the rest of the time, Dick is also going out hunting white-tailed deer with his brothers and his dad. And he's also doing a bunch of local news interviews. And he's super... He's super modest about the entire thing. He keeps getting asked, you know, how do you manage to shoot down so many enemies compared to everybody else? Why is it you? What are you doing that's different? And every single time he gives an answer that's along the lines of, I don't know, I'm just lucky. I'm just out there flying and shooting and the Japanese pilots just keep getting in my way. The rest of his leave passes by in the blink of an eye. Marge wants to marry this guy and he wants to marry her too, but he also, he doesn't want to marry her and then go off to war and pass away and then leave her a widow after dating for six weeks. So Richard basically tells Marge, the love of his life like hey I love you I want to marry you too but I can't do that and leave you a widow so if you wait for me and I make it back we'll absolutely get married and with that she promises to wait for him he goes back off to war but the one request he has before he goes is that she gives him a picture of her that he can have and she's thinking like oh he wants to like stick it on his cockpit or have it in his helmet or in his hat or whatever so she gets him some pictures and he goes back off to war So Bong gets back to the Pacific Theater and he had a little bit bigger plans than having that picture inside of his hat because he's, you know, top gun. He's the ace of aces right now. He's going to get a custom paint job. That's not an option for a lot of other pilots or other planes, especially in the Pacific where everybody's so short on supplies. But he's the top guy. If anybody's going to get a custom paint job, it's going to be him. So he's getting red nose cones, red wing tips, and he's getting that picture painted right on the side of his plane with red cursive that says Marge. And that becomes the name of his plane. He then gets teamed back up with his buddy Tom Lynch because he's back in the picture now too and then they both get pulled into General Kenny's office and they both get told they're no longer going to be attached to the same fighter wing that they were last time they were here and they both promptly kind of recoil and freak out a little bit thinking that they're going to ground both of them because they don't want to risk their top pilots. General Kenny on the other hand had a completely different idea because he kind of decides he's just going to cut them loose. Basically 
basically, you guys are freelancers. You can come and go on whatever missions you want, whenever you want to. You're the top dogs. He realizes that this war needs heroes, and these are the best two men to do it. So he's just going to let them do their thing. And this wasn't just unique to these two. The U.S. Army Air Force had actually started doing this with all their top aces, and it ended up being a great strategy and a great plan. It seems weird to us to just kind of let guys pick and choose what missions they go on. But you got to realize at the time, all these top aces were very well publicized. Everybody knew who these guys were. They were basically celebrities. I mean, not just celebrities. These guys were like superheroes to everybody else. You know what I mean? So like if you were a new pilot in World War II and you found out that Dick Bong and Tommy Lynch wanted to go on a mission with you, you felt like you were going to be invincible. I mean, it's the modern day equivalent of like walking up to a GWAT veteran that's about to step out behind the wire to go on an infantry patrol and be like, oh, hey, uh, Private Johnson, did you want... Rambo and the fucking Terminator to go on this mission with you? Like, yeah, yeah, I do. Actually, that'd be dope. So it worked out absolutely incredible. It boosted the morale of pretty much everybody because everybody got to be in the proximity of basically what amounts to a superhero. And then on top of that, it made it impossible for the Japanese to know like, okay, well, this famous aviators in this unit, this famous aviators in that unit. Now they're just moving around all over the place. So at any given time that you try to engage the American Air Force, they might have a main character sitting there waiting to fuck up your entire day. So Dick Bong and Tommy Lynch both get teamed up as wingmen. Tommy Lynch has 18 confirmed kills. Dick Bong has 20 and they go on an absolute tear going on crazy missions, shooting down everything they come in contact with. They end up earning the nickname, the flying circus. So this goes on for about a month. They go on a ton of missions together. And then in February of 1944, the Americans intercept a transmission saying that a plane is taking off right now from Rabul and it is full of a bunch of Japanese generals and high ranking military people. And it's making its way over to WeWAC which is right on the edge of their area of operation. What are you waiting for? Chinese New Year? Go, go, go. Kenny immediately sends Lynch and Bong. I mean, full sprint to the planes on the airstrip, taking off just the two of them. They fly all the way there, 400 miles an hour, just maxing out their P-38s, trying to get there in time. They hit the WeWAC airstrip and this transport plane with all the military officers just landed and it's taxiing towards a shelter building. It is at this point that Lynch radios over to Bong and is like, hey, we were in such a hurry to get here. I don't have any of my sight markers set up to be able to shoot accurately. You're gonna have to take this shot. So Bong dives down, strafes this plane, arcs back up, gets ready to do a U-turn to make a second strafing run when the plane blows up completely and they both dip, they bounce, they're gone, they make their getaway. Now shooting a plane that's on the ground doesn't count towards your tally for the ace of aces however inside of that transport plane it was later confirmed that there was a major general a brigadier general and their entire staff so that one plane had a much bigger impact on the war than any singular zero could have ever had and this really goes to show bong's integrity because all he had to do to get that transport plane to count as an aerial victory for his tally for ace of aces was to say that it was like a foot off the ground and it was about to land his buddy tommy lynch would have absolutely signed off to whatever he he said and then that would have counted but bong didn't want that because that's not what happened he didn't care about padding his stats because he didn't care about any of that stuff he was just there to do his job one month later march 1944 bong and lynch are out on another mission and they are strafing japanese ships inside of the harbor they make their first pass they strafe these ships they go up they go to make a second pass where they're strafing and one of the ships is able to hit lynch's plane and the plane goes down and it was too low to the ground for him to be able to bail out with a parachute and his body was never recovered. General Kenny being essentially what amounts to Bong's guardian angel at this point said that Bong appeared to be handling the death of his friend fine. However, I mean, it can't be fine, right? Even if you're putting on a strong face, you know that shit hurts. So he had ended up giving Bong a mission where he was going to taxi down to Australia and he was going to fly a new plane back and he had radioed down to Australia and he told the commander that was in charge of this new plane that Bong was being sent to pick up. Hey, I'm sending down one of my guys to pick up this plane and drive it back. That plane is not going to be ready for at least two weeks. And if it is, I'm going to demote you at least two pay grades. Do you understand? And this was General Kenny's creative way of getting Bong leave 
without making Bong feel like he was taking leave. To make things even worse, during this time while Bong was away, some random pilot needed to go on a reconnaissance mission and his plane was being worked on. So he's like, oh, well, I'll just take, you know, Dick Bong's famous plane with the custom paint job that everybody knows as Marge. And I'm just going to fly out on this recon mission. I'm not going into combat. Shouldn't be an issue. And he ends up crashing the fucking plane into the jungles of New Guinea. And it was never found ever again until like two months ago. So in 2024, they actually did track down this plane they found it and fun fact the only way they were actually able to identify it was because of the red paint that was extremely unique to Bong's custom paint job. So he gets back to base. He finds out that some pilot wrecked his plane, doesn't really care that much. He's just happy that the pilot survived and he was okay. Otherwise he didn't really care. He ends up riding home to Marge and is like, Hey, look, I got like 24 confirmed downed enemy aircraft. I got two more to go to tie the record. One more breaks the record. If I break this record, they're going to give me leave, send me home on a war bond tour, and then I can finally come home, see you, see my family. That's what I really want. That's his new goal. He needs to down three enemies because he wants to go home. Next couple of days, he goes out on a mission. Dick Bong wants to down three enemies. He's going to down three enemies, and that's exactly what he does. He downs one, downs another, downs the third right above the water, like 10 feet above the water line. He absolutely smoked this last zero. Goes back, lands. He's like, cool, I just broke the record. And they're like, well, actually, um, there was no film in that random P-38 that you jumped in because, you know, your plane was gone and nobody, nobody loaded that spare P-38 up with gun film. And there's only two witnesses for two of the planes and nobody saw the third one. So now you're just, you're just tied for the record, actually. To which Bong is like, I mean, <laughs> F fine, fine, whatever. Goes up the very next day, shoots down one enemy. Now he's at 27. He's broken the record. Are you not entertained? Are you not entertained? So now he's got 28. He is the ace of aces. He has had more aerial victories than any other U.S. aviator in U.S. military history. The news breaks out. They're having celebrations, the whole nine yards. Eddie Rickenbacker, his childhood hero, calls him on the phone. They record the conversation. It's like scripted, so it's kind of awkward, but they record the conversation they have. Eddie Rickenbacker sends in that case of scotch that he promised. General Kenny gives him that case of champagne that he promised. Now, remember, this isn't too far after Pro prohibition, giving troops alcohol was controversial when they said they were going to do it. It's probably going to be controversial when they actually do it. So General Kenny's boss, General Hap Arnold, actually sends him a bunch of Coca-Cola instead. And then General MacArthur gets reminded of the fact that he promised to send Bong or whoever breaks Rickenbacker's record an entire case of champagne. So naturally, MacArthur, being a man of his word, sends that case of champagne. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, MacArthur, remaining entirely on brand, proceeds to smoke his corncob pipe while shying away from conflict and having other people handle it for him. He has his staff issue a public statement, more or less wagging the finger at General Kenny and Eddie Rickenbacker saying that he doesn't think it's appropriate to incentivize young troops with alcohol. Lying son of a bitch. I'm sorry, I'm not a very big MacArthur fan and it's showing. I apologize. Anyways, the media goes absolutely crazy and they all show up. They want to take pictures of Dick Bong, America's ace of aces with his legendary P-38 Marge. And they get there and they're like, oh yeah, that plane crashed. We don't have it anymore. It's not that big of a deal. He only shot down like four planes in it anyways. He's just been flying normal P-38s like everybody else the rest of the time. But the Army PR department's like, no, no, we'll make another one that's an exact replica. So they go, they get another P-38, they paint it up the exact same way and then he goes and takes a bunch of pictures with it despite the fact he's never even flown the thing. Not long after this, Bong gets word, hey, you're grounded. You're going to go back to America for a little bit. You're the new ace of aces. We can't be sending you up on missions and having you getting killed. You're way too important. So he kind of sort of got exactly what he wanted. But Bong has one request for Major Kenny. Once he gets back to the States, but before he goes back home to Wisconsin, he wanted to attend gunnery school. To which General Kenny and everybody else in the chain of command is like, what the fuck are you talking about? You're the best fighter ace in American history. Why do you want to go back to school for more training? Then, in what is probably the greatest demonstration of humility and leadership that I've ever seen, Bong goes on to explain to General Kenny that he doesn't feel like he's very good at gunnery. He doesn't feel like he's a good shot. And he tells the general, I don't shoot that great. I just get so close to the enemy. I can't miss at a range. I'm not that good. And I feel like when I was taught gunnery three years prior, it was when we hadn't fully developed it. And I feel like they've made a lot of advancements and I need to go learn that so that when I come back, I can teach all my men that missed out on that training as well. So they agree. They grant his wish. Dick Bong, America's ace of aces, the man that has shot down more enemy aircrafts than anyone else on the planet is going back to school to learn how to shoot. 
And then Dick Bong turns around, storms back in General Kenny's office. He's like, oh, and one more thing. Okay, one more favor. I want you to look for that other plane that I shot down that film didn't capture and apparently nobody witnessed. I shot it down right above the waterline, pulls out General Kenny's map, puts a circle on it. He's like, it's right there. I shot off its left wing and I shot the cockpit. It's there. I guarantee it. If you get a chance and that section gets cleared, send divers down there. I shot down that plane. To which General Kenny's kind of like, uh, I don't understand why you care so much about this particular plane when you give away half your aerial victories to your guys anyways. But I mean, whatever. Sure. If I get a chance to verify that plane's down there, I will happily do so and make sure that you get awarded that aerial victory. Bong never did write down why he cared so much about this particular aerial victory, but I think it was because it was really the first time in his career that his integrity had ever been questioned. He had given away so many other aerial victories and he was very, very honest and straightforward with his record and what he had accomplished. And the one time that he had claimed to have done something that couldn't be substantiated, not having people believe him, I think kind of rubbed him the wrong way, which understandably, it would rub me the wrong way too. Regardless, America's Ace of Aces heads back to America, goes to gunnery school, and while he's there, that sector of the Pacific does get cleared of the enemy, and General Kenny has the opportunity to send divers down, and being true to his word, he does just that. They pull this plane, out of the ocean and fucking sure enough it was hit 11 times almost cutting off the left wing and hitting the cockpit shooting the pilot in the chest and the head downing the plane for sure dick bong gets credit for an aerial victory when he's on the other side of the planet back in america he now has 28 aerial victories. Meanwhile, Bong is still at gunnery school, honing his skills, getting better and better. And then finally he gets done with that. And he's like, okay, perfect. Now I'm finally going to go back home to Wisconsin and I'm finally going to propose to my girlfriend, Marge. But then the big green weenie strikes again and the chain of command steps in and is like, actually counter offer, instead of you going home, what if we paraded you around the entire country to sell more war bonds and made you talk to the news every second of every day? And this is a rhetorical question. You have to do it. To which Bong is like, I mean, Okay, it's not great. I would way rather go home, but I guess at the end of the day, I'm just talking about flying and doing my job, which I love. So as long as I get to, you know, talk about something I love and tell everybody the truth, I, I guess I could do that. And that's when the government's like, well, actually, we're going to assign a bunch of PR people that are going to tell you exactly what to say instead. So he goes out, he gets paraded around the country. He hates it pretty much the entire time. And he gets progressively more and more agitated with the situation because he's going from place to place telling the right answers and not actually how he feels about the situation. It eventually kind of comes to a boiling point when a reporter asked Bong straight up, like, why are you here? Why would they take their best pilot out of the game? And Bong just deadpans, looks the reporter straight in the face and is like, so I don't die. Which is not the politically correct answer that he was supposed to respond to that question with, but it is 100% the truth. Then there's this awkward silence, and the reporter asks another question, and Bong is, he's, he's finally had enough. Bong just goes, you know what? Just ask that guy over there. He's the PR guy. He knows all the answers. I gotta go. And he leaves. After that, the chain of command is like, okay, fine. Just go back home to Wisconsin. You've earned it. Have some time off. And then we'll figure out where to go from there. So he makes his way back to Superior, Wisconsin. Finally catches back up with Marge. And he wants to propose to her. But there's reporters all over him all the time. And if it's not reporters, it's his family. If it's not his family, it's friends that want to catch up with him. And if it's not friends that want to catch up with him, it's just random strangers that want to meet Dick Bong, America's ace of aces, the the war hero. The man is just trying to propose to his girlfriend Marge and he can't get five seconds alone with her. The only alone time this guy gets is when he's taking a dump and it's driving him nuts, okay? And then one day, finally, he's just, he's had enough of this shit. He's in the car with Marge and he pulls over on the side of the road and he gets out in the middle of a cornfield and proposes to Marge and she says yes. And then the media finds out about that. Then they want to interview him about that and it just makes the attention factor that much more intense. And finally, he's like, okay, I just, I have to find a cockpit. I have to get back up in a plane to get away from people so I can have a moment to think to myself. So he's like, okay, cool. He goes to the nearest U.S. Army airfield in Wisconsin and walks onto base and is like, yo, dick bong, ace of aces. I want to fly a P-38, hook it up. Now, I couldn't find out the exact unit or airfield, but presumably it was like a National Guard or Reserve unit. So they're like starstruck. They're like looking at the picture like... You're Dick Bong. And he's like, yeah, I know. Okay, just can I fly a plane or not? And they're like, I mean, I, I, 
yeah, I guess. So they let him take a P-38 and then he goes and he's like buzzing his parents' house and he's buzzing over Marge's house. He buzzes the high school that his brother's in. He's just like doing aerial stunts over Poplar and Superior, Wisconsin. And like nobody's batting an eye. It's just like, oh, that's just our local superhero doing stunts in a P-38 overhead. Then he starts getting a bunch of news coverage for that, which is fine because he doesn't have to talk to anybody or interview about it. He just gets to go up and fly a plane and do cool shit, which is what he loves. So that's that goes on for a couple of weeks and then finally his leave is coming to an end he says goodbye to marge they don't get married yet but they plan on getting married as soon as the war gets over and then he has to set back off he's got one more big press conference before he heads back over the pacific so he goes into this press conference he's he's being good he's answering the questions the way he's supposed to you know and one of the journalists is finally like you know mr bong have you been paying much attention to the news and he's like i mean not really it seems like you guys are paying attention to me i don't have much time to pay attention to you guys they're like oh so have you heard about your 28th aerial victory? And he's like, what? And he goes, yeah, General Kenny actually dr dug up that plane out of the bottom of the ocean floor and proved that you downed 28 enemy aircrafts to which Bong is like, I fucking knew it. Oh. Fast forward a couple weeks, Bong is back over in the Pacific. He's meeting up with General Kenny and he's like, okay, here's the plan, Bong. You're gonna be an instructor, how about that? And Bong is like, counter offer, what if instead I do a little bit of instructing and then I get back up in the sky and shoot down all the enemies so I can end this war and go back home and marry my girlfriend, how about that? And General Kenny is just like, you know, you know I can't send you up there. You're the ace of aces, I can't have you getting hurt, okay? And you're gonna end the war faster if you're a teacher, right? Because if you train 100 new pilots how to shoot and fly better and you make them even 5% better and that 5% translates to one more kill for every guy you've taken down 500 enemy planes not just the 20 or 30 extra that you can take down yourself to which bong is just like uh, i know i understand that but also i want to fly it's literally all i've ever wanted to do it's my whole shtick i've worked for it my whole life i don't want to talk to the news i don't want to be famous i don't want to be the ace of aces i just want to do my job to which kenny is like i i know okay just look Train, train a bunch of guys first, and then if that goes well, I'll figure out some way to get you back up in a P-38. To which Bong is like, okay, fine. For General Kenny, I'll do it. General Kenny's been my number one guy the entire time ever since I was in flight school. He's always had my back. If he says he's gonna do this for me, I know he's gonna make it happen somehow. So Bong goes and proceeds to be the best instructor that he possibly can be. He's going around the Pacific from airfield to airfield, from island to island, training all the P-38 pilots with all the new gunnery techniques that he's just learned and mastered as well as all the flight techniques that he already knew. And Bong is such a good instructor that after like six weeks, General Kinney can actually see in the after action reports that the accuracy and the engagement distances are both increasing for all of the P-38s in the Pacific Theater that have gone through Bong's training. After realizing this, General Kinney knows he's got to keep his word to Bong, so he calls Bong into his office and he's like, okay, look, I'm going to let you go up in a P-38 on a mission. We have a major bombing run, like a hundred bombers are going to go bomb an oil refinery on the island of Borneo, and we're going to have a bunch of P-38s flying overhead as escort to fight off Japanese fighters if they show up, okay? You can go up with the P-38s, you're not allowed to engage offensively. You can only shoot to defend yourself, and that is it. You are supposed to lay back and observe. So they take off on this mission. It is 35 P-38 Lightnings escorting 100 American bombers to this oil refinery, and on their way there, like a hundred Japanese fighters show up. So the P-38s are outnumbered like three to one, but here's the thing. This is Dick Bong and 34 other P-38 Lightning pilots that have been trained by Dick Bong going toe to toe with a hundred Japanese pilots in like mid to late 1944. If you don't know, the Japanese military at this point in time, not doing too hot, especially when it comes to planes and pilots. They had the strategy of instead of taking out their best pilots and having them go and train the next generation, they just kept them in the field the entire time and by this point in the war, most, if not all of them, have all died in combat, and all of these new pilots are both A, new guys, and B, they have subpar training because the Empire of Japan no longer has the resources to get them adequate flight time before sending them into battle. And the point I'm trying to get across is that despite the fact that the Japanese had a pretty
pretty significant numerical advantage, they still proceeded to get their asses whooped by the P-38 Lightnings. By the end of the skirmish, they had lost one P-38 and the Japanese had lost 60 planes. They then proceed, bomb the oil refinery, come back, mission was a huge success, and then Bong writes his after action report, turns that into General Kenny. General Kenny, getting ready for bed at night, I presume, having a nice beverage, decides that he's gonna read the after action reports of his number one guy, and Bong's after action reports really haven't changed that much at all. He's still very straightforward, very concise, brief, not braggadocious whatsoever. Dick Bong recorded two kills during the battle. All right, so now General Kenny, I presume a little bit on edge, maybe pouring himself another drink and he's like, okay, okay, well just, I'll read the next line in the text and he's gonna explain to me in detail why this was a very defensive kill and he had to do this. Next line of text, both of them were shot within less than a thousand feet of me. And you know, when you're in a plane traveling 380 miles an hour, a thousand feet away might as well be touching one another. Doesn't sound very defensive to General Kenny. So next morning, General Kenny calls Bong into his office and is basically like, dude, we had a deal. You were just supposed to be observing, okay? You were only supposed to defend yourself. To which Bong is like, I was. They were both defensive kills. Well, I mean, at least one of them was. And General Kenny's like, okay, whatever. I'm listening. Let's hear this excuse. Okay, well, the first plane I actually did attack, but I only attacked because I was observing like I was supposed to be doing. I was just watching. And because I was the only one observing the battle, I was the only one that noticed the Japanese recon plane that was running away from the battle to go get back up. And I knew that I had to go shoot him down so he didn't bring a bunch of backup. So I went, I dived on him and I shot him down. And General Kenny's like, okay, okay, fine. Explain the other one. Well, after I dived on the recon plane, I went, I got back up in formation and there was a Japanese zero that made a pass at one of my wingmen. And then he made a pass at the other wingman. And then he made a pass at me and I wasn't putting up with that shit. So I got behind him and I shot him down. At which point, General Kenny is like, how close? How close did you have to get to the enemy plane to shoot him down? I sent you that fancy gunnery school so you could learn how to shoot people from far away. How close did you get to the guy? Obviously, I'm paraphrasing throughout this conversation, but Bong more or less says, I'm pretty sure my guns were touching the canopy of his cockpit when I opened fire. To which General Kenny at this point is like, dude, come on. You know what? Actually, you know, it's, it's fine. It's fine. We destroyed that oil refinery. The war is coming to an end. There's really not many more missions to even send you out on. So I hope you enjoyed your last hurrah. That was probably the end of it. The war is basically over. Everything's fine. Congratulations. You got 30 confirmed aerial victories. Nice round number. You destroyed Eddie Rickenbacker's record. Just good job. Fast forward like a month, October 1944. Things are about to heat up again because MacArthur is about to fulfill his promise and return to the Philippines. And he's going to want to make a grand entrance. So he goes ahead and he tells Kenny, hey, report to this airstrip. I want all of your top P-38 aces there. I'm going to meet every one of them and shake their hand. And then we're going to go retake the Philippines. So General McKinney and General MacArthur are at the staging airstrip. All of the top P-38 aces from the entire Pacific theater are showing up, landing their planes, parking them, getting out, and they are going to shake hands with both the generals. So this is going on. And then General Kenny looks over and he sees Dick Bong getting out of a plane. And he's just like, Bong, Mayor. Bong comes walking up with a big shit-eating grin on his face, greets the generals, at which point General Kenny is like, what? What are you doing here? And Dick Bong is like, what? General, the standing order that I was told was that all P-38 Lightning aces are to report to this airstrip at this time. So here I am. I mean, he doesn't come out and say it, but he basically says, you know, you guys thought you were going to have a badass convention and I wasn't going to show up, really? So General Kenny is like, Bong, did you take that order to mean that we were actually going to let you fly combat? To which Bong replies, I don't know, can I? And as soon as he says that, the alarm sirens start going off because the radar array has picked up five enemy planes headed towards the airstrip. Bong pretty much yells dibs and runs out to his plane and gets airborne. And four other ace pilots are looking like, was that Dick Bong? We better follow him. So they go with him. They go up there, shoot down four of the five, no problem. And the other one gets away. How many men does it take to deliver a message? One. And one of those kills goes directly to Dick Bong. He's been there for a total of like 15 minutes. He's already scored an air-to-air -air victory in front of two of the generals and pretty much everybody else. The very next morning, Bong volunteers to go out on a non-combat recon mission by himself early in the morning, you know, kind of trying to make it up to the chain of command. Like, hey, I can be here. I don't necessarily have to go out on the combat missions, but I love flying. I want to help you guys. Like, even if it's just flying out and looking for another airstrip because this one's kind of cramped, I'm happy to do it. That was his intentions. 
He gets airborne first thing in the morning by himself. And as soon as he gets up in the sky, the fucking tower radios him and is like, hey, um, we've got two enemy planes coming towards the island. And Bong is like, <sighs> bear in mind at this point in time, Bong can still only fight defensively. However, he's the only one up in the air that's going to be able to stop these two planes before they strafe the entire camp. So sounds defensive enough to him. And sometimes the best defense is a good offense. So he asks the tower, tell me where they're at. The tower tells him where they're at. He makes a beeline towards these planes to intercept them in his interceptor. As Major Bong is making his way to intercept these two Japanese planes, the sirens are going off down on the ground because the camp is about to get strafed with enemy gunfire and people are start scrambling. They're running around. They're trying to get planes up in the air. And then eventually everybody realizes, oh shit, Dick Bong is up there and everybody just gets to stop and gets a front row seat to watch the Ace of Aces down two more enemies by himself. And then he comes back down, lands completely unscathed, and it's just the most main character shit that has ever happened in human history. During this time, Major Bong's writing back home to Marge and he's like, look, I'm doing good. I got 36. I think if I can get four more, I'm going to hit 40. Nice, even round number. And I think they'll finally let me go home because they won't want me out here getting killed. That's his aspiration. He's he loves flying. He also just wants to go back home and be with his fiance. And then one day the air raid sirens go off. And when that happens, whatever pilots are available, jump in whatever planes have fuel and ammo in them and they take off and they handle the issue. And it just so happens on this particular day that some random military pilot by the name of Captain Davis goes and jumps in Major Bong's plane to go up and handle the issue. And as soon as he gets airborne, for whatever reason on this particular day, Major Bong's P-38's plane has an engine blow up, causing him to lose control of the plane and crash it back into the island, killing Captain Davis pretty much instantly. The initial reports were saying that Major Bong was killed in combat. However, everything would get figured out and settled within a couple of hours and everybody would realize that America's Ace of Aces has somehow yet again, by seemingly a random act of fate, avoided death. After this, General Kenny realizes he has to get Bong out of here and back home. The kid has earned it, and the best way he's going to be able to get him out of here is to get him the Medal of Honor. So he goes to the chain of command, and he's like, hey, I want to get Dick Bong the Medal of Honor. To which they're like, okay, for what? And he's like, what, what do you mean? I'll tell you what. Here's the dates that he's been in the Pacific Theater. Pick a point to a random date on the calendar. I'll tell you what he did on that day that probably deserves this Medal of Honor. So General Kenny ends up writing up his Medal of Honor citation for shooting down eight enemy planes between October and November of 1944. Despite his paperwork being expedited and rushed, Major Bong still manages to shoot down two more enemies while that paperwork is getting finalized and before he's actually awarded the Medal of Honor. So he actually shot down 10 enemy aircrafts in that span of time. They couldn't go back and change the paperwork to give him credit for the other two on the citation without restarting the entire filing process, so they just left it because the ultimate goal was to actually get him out of theater. So December of 1944, they have a ceremony, he is awarded the Medal of Honor, and the very next day, he goes out on a mission and shoots down two more enemy planes, bringing his total to 40. The day after that, Bong gets told to report to General Kenny's office. Bong does so. General Kenny sits him down, and Bong already knows what's coming. He is informed that his career as a fighter pilot is over, and that he's going back home. By January of 1945, he's back in America. He's doing some PR stuff, doing some war bond drives. And by February, he marries Marge and they go on their honeymoon. After their honeymoon, Major Bong and his new wife are to report to California, where Bong's new assignment is going to be working for Lockheed as a test pilot for America's first fighter jet, the P-80 Shooting Star. This goes on for a couple of months, and on August 6, 1945, the same day that America drops the atomic bomb on Hiroshima, Major Bong goes up for his 12th test flight of the P-80 Shooting Star. Shortly after taking off, black smoke starts billowing out of the engine, and he begins losing control of the aircraft, but he's over Hollywood at this point, and if he just bails out and ditches the plane he doesn't know where it's going to land it could land in somebody's house it could land in a school so he decides that he's going to stay in the airplane and guide it and find an open field to crash this plane into but by the time he can guarantee that this plane crashing isn't going to hurt anyone he no longer has time to bail out and have his chute inflate and he plummets to his death the very next day newspapers all over the country read something along the lines of atomic bomb hits japan 
Major Bong killed in jet accident. Major Bong was 24 years old when he passed away. He worked his entire life to become a fighter pilot and he ended up being the greatest fighter pilot in American aviation history. He wasn't trying to necessarily be the best fighter pilot. He certainly didn't care about being the best fighter pilot. He just was. He flew 146 combat missions in World War II when the average pilot at that point in time only flew 30. He's credited with downing 40 enemy aircraft and that's not including all of the probables and it's certainly not including all of the ones that he basically shot down and let his men finish off so that it could improve their morale. So in conclusion, that is the absolutely incredible story of America's ace of aces, Richard Bong. Thanks for watching. Best way to support the channel is go check out some merch at thefatelectrician.com. Quack bang, out. I wasn't about to cry. Onion cutting ninjas have infested my office again. I gotta go. I gotta do announcements. Uh, first of all, don't forget to go check out War Thunder. You can fly a P-38 for yourself. Secondly, I'm giving away this custom gun cabinet. All you have to do to get entered to win is to go over to my merch store and buy any product. Doesn't matter which one it is. Every product you buy counts as one entry to win that gun cabinet. Second place is getting one of these custom pistol lock boxes. And third place is going to be getting a care package from Wiley X, my favorite shooting glasses company. So yeah, if you were ever going to get some merch, now's the time. Maybe you'll win something cool on top of it. Other than that, I know this is a really long video. I hope it was worth it. Thank you for watching. Quack bang out. Well, folks, it's a very happy day for me to be back here on this Mother's Day, be along with my mother and the mothers of these two other boys. And it'll be a much better day all around when we can get all the mothers of all the boys back together again when this thing is over.